above dance you can you could bring your own head in right and we'd float your your head above oh, dance avatars course, and they'd the dance problem. dance and sing all those people are still on your yeah. website we're not gonna license the goddamn thing we're the liberation i want to i want to set up i want to set up a public blue screen uh, uh, facility yeah. that's, oh, that's that's like yeah. the cyber cyber yeah, uh, i know you you videotape uh, what press Listen, conferences I just right and you've gone to parties just been on people's faces like celebrities too complete swath about everything i've experienced yeah. It's a difficult are, task. Like, you label everything? You know, <laughs> relatively. Like, the, the, you gotta know what the content is. Like. You gotta cut from one conversation in 1985 to a conversation in 94. Yeah, that I was saying. But that's all I've been doing for the last Maybe not. I mean, you should have jumped for a randomized play. You want to make a few. I know, I know, I know. So, I would not want to be serious about this. I want to take it from the point of view that this is going to be. So much fun. People are going to want to see it for total entertainment value. Too expensive. Yeah. About the industry, and, uh, but total entertainment. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a couple of extra sets of lights. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. Fuck these speeches, man. Oh, I like the, the DC. Clip of, have you ever had Bill yeah, Gates? So you have like ClipCon. I mean, you do the net. You do the standard things that are that are like parodies. Yeah. People just yeah. make them, you know, like put them against each other. But then you can like have. You know, total you random people saying really, you know, that, cocktail party stu type stuff right. that you've captured and insert it in there. You see, you can make it yeah. really yeah. funny. To be able yeah, to with a little nonlinear access, it gets really back trippy. Back. And the, uh, like anonymous people yeah. with celebrities. I mean, it's the whole maelstrom of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good project. I'd like to do it if I can find them on time. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, That's what you should do timing. with the archive, man. That's, coming. That's yeah, the archive. You gotta create one, ideal. like one hour thing. Um, I think it's it's a video at first. Right. You know, it's the next, because it's just yeah. you know yeah. to run it, make it entertaining. Right, the they next step might be to, to try and get more creative with like a mud. But that's kind so of that's too much. Well, we got a website. That's our first yeah, entry, you, you and then we we'll start putting clips in it and um, expand from there. The problem with websites is it's not dynamic oh, enough. See, this kind of thing, the so timing are a set of is everything you try and get humor. Okay? You've got to do it right. To control their okay. I wouldn't even do it as a CD-ROM, because I think it would be better as a video right. at first. As a quick time movie as well as on a CD-ROM, or as a digital video on a CD-ROM, fine. Yeah. But, interactive, maybe. That's, that's like another dimension. But what I was thinking of was, Pure and lunacy. <laughs> so uh, this is the background. No, something they put on TV, man. Something that would get go pretty far. Other than the fact that it might be censored material, and it would only go on the X-rated channels. But X-rated channels are coming, thanks to the Senate and Congress, thanks to the voluntary, sense, you know, sense, uh, rating system. Well, we'll try playing with R just to see if we can do it. R-rated, R-rated channels are coming. That's actually the better thing. Adults will flock to. Yeah, that's where we Just like they flock to R-rated movies. Yeah. It's the greatest thing that's happened. I think that's so we'll, we'll be, we'll have an R. Or, yeah, we're also playing with the term M for mature. You know what I'm saying? Mature. Well, that's the same thing as PG. No, it's not. Brent no. M. So we could do a RM. Well, we could keep it clean. We don't need any of that gratuitous sex unless it's like... In kind of a Mel Brooks style. Yeah. Or we could play with whole new strike and we could, for the women stuff, we could do MS. Rating MS. Well, I still like the linear form, see, and I think yeah. that. Yeah. That's humor. That. That's right. Timing is everything. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta do it right. That's a humor piece. Tony says we gotta really, for certain things, we have to wait till the technology catches up to us. Like, uh, timing is everything in humor. And so, um, Audio needs to timing. We can't have any of this this asynchronous stuff in audio. But I, I say more no, no, no. simultaneity. I think you start yeah. the story. More now. Come on. More simultaneity. <laughs> more simultaneity. More like now? multiple layers, like four or five layers at the same time that can really flow in and out of each other. <laughs> well, you can turn. You know, so that so people could do things together, <laughs> mix their stuff together. So here's what I would do. I would do a story that is totally humorous, the best possible piece of entertainment in one hour that you could do with that material. Yeah. And then I would do the interactive version, which is kind of a little bit like what the media band Mark Canner's piece was, which is like wherever you click, you get this different kind of mm -hmm. conversations going, yeah. people talking. Uh -huh. And yeah. you can mix it up like crazy. Yeah, yeah. And it might be more levels after that, like a game or a mud. But you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. You gotta start with something that catches everyone's attention at once. That's, I think, that's what it Let's was. see, that's um, it would be a, um, a video. sex, religion, a video uh, politics. A give it away to um, promote the next one, the interactive version. Well, that is so funny. It's played everywhere. 
Everybody's got to see it. Got to be funny. Forget Everybody's about the specific to topics. That's the number key, key thing. Now, you put it on your web page, you better have, I mean, that's nuts. Technology's not there yet. Because well, you want this to be full screen fast. You know, absolutely no timing problems in something like that. It can't be small, then. No, we're talking, about, we're talking about mainstream entertainment about our industry that could make, that could leak out into real entertainment. And it's free to the Netscape model. Yeah. And you drag people to your website okay. and you sell the interactive and version. Turn on. We all got our bag of tricks. Uh, interact. You know? <laughs> I, I say there's a lot more we can do with real time stuff on the web now that are available, we're just not utilizing yet. And hey, I, I, I'm telling I, you. I think that's really the direction it's going because then we have total, we don't have to deal with anybody but us right here. We can just go to our meeting and it's up, right? I mean, no hassles. We're fast approaching the age yeah. of instant manifestation of vision through energy. Well, the only way to give something away is through the net. The problem is digital video is not ready for the net. Well, I, I would question that statement. I'd say it's evolving, right? <laughs> At, as far as I know. I just discovered this two days ago on the net. So. One sentence, okay? Yeah. He wants to do the fabulous, most fabulous Mark Hanna show on the network that's ever been. Click here for more. Yeah, I, I this is like Colleen. It. <laughs> She's busy doing net, uh, Go in. Uh -huh. maps and addresses to the next party. So all you guys out there, gals too, we hope, this is where we are. Is it high? Just a walking thing off backwards. Oh, yeah, we made it. We just made the trolley right at the corner here. Check it out. The next stop on the tour. Yeah, the trolley ride. Cheers, the splash. Yeah, sure. So you're like a host uh, for the party? Okay. Yes. You, sir. Howdy. Howdy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, battery too low. Yes. The story of my life, the battery's too low. Yes. I tell you. <laughs> there you, sir. Another century. Plus, keep one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. It's a, it's a character I have a Get away from side. me. I put a hex on me. Ah, that's You wish we give you the story of David. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think of technology, sir? I don't know about this. You better get away from me. Can you see me in there? What are you doing down there? That is. <laughs> Pretty cool little toy. Do a big uh, presentation about why this is. Team behind 
it's good. Yes. We've been working together for a while, looks like. Yes, we have. <laughs> How long have you known each other? Oh, about an hour now. <laughs> Already in business. <laughs> one to check out? I'm not sure. I haven't really had a chance to check them all out. But they're, they're, they have various different music formats, some classical, well, some them? country. On the Netscape? Uh... Um, in Real Audio, www.realaudio.com. they got a link to all the radio stations there, so you'll be able to find Once you get a link to one, you'll be able to get a link to all of them. Cool. virus, which supposedly has a geodesic dome kind of structure to its molecular components, in, in uh, case the radioactive waste could encase 
Just the radioactive the waste. <laughs> and then and the other thing. Everybody <laughs> no, no. And then the other thing and that then, you wanted was so the idea you. that that radioactive AIDS virus, which we know appears to have been artificially induced to cattle down in Africa, evil, totally and evil. appears to have been manufactured by human intelligence potentially, as opposed to just a freak of nature. And uh, are the lizard kings anywhere in this Ukraine? That manufactured virus, which started out as a bovine, uh, bovine uh, cattle mutilation. No, no, no. Monkeys. Okay, no, it, uh, it was uh, that were exposed to nuclear reactive toxins would uh, be able to recover with the AIDS virus. <laughs> I get it. Questions for you. I've seen it. I, I have a video tour of you with a large big picture showing the shadows were off and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. You have the book? Yeah. It's enough to uh, play with. Okay. It's got new data. Okay, so speaking to the light. You want to get to the light? It's new data. Yeah. <laughs> That's your mic, really? Okay. Moonshot. Total funny. Where are the stars? Take a look. Are you using any stars in any moonshot ever, ever? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the shadows are totally wrong. Uh, the spacesuits. Uh, the spacesuits. Um, uh, when, you, when, when the guys, uh, uh, the lunar rover, when it turns a corner, the dirt doesn't go up like into the sky. It just goes up a few feet, like it does in the Earth. Uh, the uh, when they jump, when they try to jump, when he said, "I'm going to watch you, I can jump like crazy." He shouldn't be able to jump six fucking feet in the air. How high did he jump? Eighteen fucking inches. You explain it to me. Done. What's real here, Wes? Did they ever get it up at all? They never, I'll tell you what. I worked on the lunar module. I know lunar module is a friend of mine. <laughs> Wait a I don't, it never could have gotten to space? I, the lunar time. module was totally fucked up from the get-go. When we stood around, all the engineers stood around the lunar module, and we, we saw it touch down. We all said, holy shit, how did they do that? <laughs> there was no way. We couldn't believe it. I did videotapes. I did the first videotapes on how to on the cold flow facility at the lunar module. I could. How do you explain the six gravity? And really? those videotapes were proved are proof that no one knew what they were doing in constructing the lunar module. It was all a farce. Yeah, but how do, they, how do you explain how they were walking with one six gravity? They weren't walking with one six gravity. Or was it? Or they was were. It they slow were, motion. They were slow mo. Slow mo. It's easy. Come on. Uh, okay, well, where can we see this evidence? Uh, there's a book called NASA Mooned America. Perhaps we'll see this on the web soon. Huh? And yeah. it'll be up on the... Uh, I, the rumor has it that Zandor is creating a website. So look for, uh, look for his website. Coming to a... Uh, what are you working at for? Uh, well, Alan is a viewer's list of digital video magazine. Oh, yeah. 
Web TV. Call the wireless broadcast to our Netscape browser. Yeah. You're going to be live with the Netscape developer party. Sonny has an amazing website. You should know about it. Really? Yeah. He's telling us some amazing stuff we're putting up on the web now. We don't know if there's a grant of truth to it or not, but we're going to get some cross references on this. Which one? He's like saying. Spot is number one. What? He's saying that the entire moonshot was not real. And he's got proof for it. Moonshot? The moonshot. Going to Mar Mar Neil Armstrong on the moon. One small oh, step for man. Oh, you guys. Conspiracy theorists. I'm smelling. Ah, uh, but. Yes. And what better way to solve it than the cover? enough uh, stuff on VRML. I mean, people are going with uh, Alpha World or, uh, you know. Much better. Better than Alpha World? Much better. On VRML? Right. We were actually one of the first companies in the world to create a VRML model on the internet called the Land of Oz, which got quite a lot of attention uh, last summer. Uh -huh. uh, after that, we sort of hid ourselves in the dark and have been working steadily on, on uh, the VRML, enhanced VRML. And, uh, a client server suite which will uh, support most of the well how do you get the speed out of VRML? Well that's yeah. prior to technology. Are you moving worlds? Yes. Yeah. And uh, what uh, tools are you using? Another thing which is uh, unique, uh, we have a unique combination of both being a you know, high-tech 3D programming company as well as uh, five years experience in uh, high-end 3D design, working on the soft image and alias system. We created our own proprietary converter, which converts uh, models created in uh, soft image into VRML models. Uh, this allows us to create really nice uh, 3D images, 3D worlds, convert them easily into VRML models, uh, which you haven't even seen on the web today. The quality is, is much, much better. Wow. Uh, Internet World Exhibition, San Jose. Can we preview it so we can do it? No, it's a countdown. So, uh, we need to see it like a couple days in advance so we can do advanced stories on it. Can you let us know when it's coming up? Uh, we will have, I'm going back to Iceland uh, two weeks time, actually I'm going to Japan, we have been doing some business in Japan as well, but uh, I'm going back, uh, when I come back again, which will be around the uh, 1st of April. Call the email, yeah. and let us know, we'll get together and interview you, okay? Great. Good, 3D chat this way. <laughs> wait, 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 let's have round rules here, okay? Uh, converting soft image models into VRMAN models, we are also able to create, you know, environments, VRML, thermal environments. Uh, today, no one has seen. Uh, the quality is unbelievable. Uh, but, but like I said, before I write it, April 1st. Exactly, before you write anything, because we do.
And what does it allow you to do? I mean, as a Again, an enhanced value when viewing my web pages because when they see this button, it says, if you push here and you got the uh, plugin, you can see what this page, this new page has to offer. And if you don't have the plugin, well, it's just garbage for you. It's garbage, or can you still like view it, or is it like total? What, 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 what the uh, response is on the web server is this page has no content. focus on his eyes. Oh yeah. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Can, let's focus. Uh, like we just focus on your eyes. going to make any money on the web till 19 uh, to, to like the turn of the century. Do you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, it's I, going to take I, a few I, years before I, anybody makes any money on this. Does that mean you're not going to spend any money on the web until then? Um, do you know, funny enough, I've been working in this business, but I've yet to make one secure transaction over the internet. Yeah. yeah for, better yet, I've yet to make one transaction over the internet. <laughs> I see. So. But I will. Yes. Everyone will. Huh? You will. <laughs> Prepare for more. Nice <laughs> See you later, man. Yeah. Bye bye. See you. Are you on the street of San Francisco? Are you camping? Yep. Is on this the street thing on? Francisco. Yeah. It's on. On the streets. On the streets. On the you know, this is Planet Hollywood, and you see the sign here. You know, and of course. The one and only Macy's, remember it, 19, in 1996, while it was still open, before the Mafia took over Mexico. <laughs> and Russia. Oh, well. I tell you. Remember the question whether no one will make money on the web until the year 2000? Yeah. You will definitely make money in the year 2000 when you can show this real to the world. Yeah. We are on the net, right? And, yeah, we're all famous. <laughs> yes. By 2000, we'll be able to show this video on the net. <laughs> in, in zero, zero, Did time I zero, zero. Yeah. It. All right. Drive dangerously now. <laughs>
sunny day today out in the country. It looks really it's just before spring begins really. The trees are still bare. Let's take a look at this angle though. This is a nice time of day for the light. And you can see the, the hustle and bustle of the insectoid world. Look at that big spider web. Look at all the bugs put on the dais. You can see why the spiders do what they do. They take every opportunity to build webs everywhere, even with our garden house here. The spot of flies seem to be going into our wall. they're doing in there. Yes, a prolific time for insects. I think we even have a bee's nest. Yeah, that's my Friends. Yes, how much can I zoom in from here? Oh, well, too bad. Such a little shake. Fountains like them. And they sparkle off the little faces of the uh, of the amethyst, too. Oh, how beautiful! What a trip! <sighs> My God. That's great. <laughs> well, Jonica and Ananda be at your party. Good. I'm interested in multi user spaces through my background in mods and stuff. Um, and so we've been lately with VRML because it's been kind of moving along. We've been able to start building spaces where people can share the space and you know talk about things and stuff, and hopefully start building interactive spaces where you kind of take this mud technology that a lot of people have used and move it into 3D and pick up objects and you know have games and things. Um, that's kind of where we're where we're going with all of this at least with uh, the project we did with MTT. And then, of course, it has other applications, being able to share space. Um, you know, problems, you said three. <laughs> um, the big problem we're working with right now is that, in fact, um, we're using things like Java and VRML and tools that um, three months ago nobody had. And so we're kind of breaking new ground. Um, so that's a kind of a big problem <laughs> of sorts that, that we're having to invent a lot. Um, and then everything else kind of spawns from there. Uh, I have been doing MUDs for about six years and am used to having a lot more power at my command than I've got with these tools right now, where it's pretty trivial in a MUD to pick up an object. In fact, right now that's a lot of programming and it hasn't been done yet, um, at least in our, in our stuff. <laughs> so. Um, where I'm going with this for the next three months or so, I hope, is to um, start dealing with some of these issues. There's issues of communication, there's issues of avatar design, there's issues of space design. I'm a technology person and I, I leave the rest of that up to the other people on the team, but I'm specifically interested in, um, you know, we've got the internet here and it's in its great medium, but it does have its problems and trying to work around those. Um, for instance, with latency and stuff, it's difficult if you're going to pick up an object to figure out who actually got it, you know, um, and stuff like that. So, those are kind of the issues that I'm dealing with. Marvin, <coughs> the uh, the biography in the uh, in your little pamphlet was one done for Starbright, so it is not necessarily germane to this science. Um, but I am a technologist, 
Um, I am the Vice President of Development currently for Worlds. Um, so I do the technology stuff. Of the three biggest problems, uh, in no particular order, I would say community is the first largest problem at the establishment of community. Worlds is about social computing. That was, that is what we were founded to do. That's what we've been trying to do since. To create a community is a, is a hard problem. Um, to make sections where people can build and interact in more than a, a fairly uh, casual way, in a deep, rich way, is, is a hard problem. And that's one that we're very interested in solving. Um, the second problem is the technical. I guess the first one is social, the second one is technical, um, which should give you a hint for the third one. Uh, the technical problems right now, frame rate is our biggest bugaboo. If it's slow, it isn't immersive. If you can't pick things up, it isn't immersive. If there's a barrier between you and the other person on the other side of the internet, and your ability to talk to them, to relate with them, is in some way compromised, then it's not immersive. We're trying to make you forget about the fact that you're sitting at a keyboard and they're sitting at a keyboard, and there's hundreds or thousands of miles between you. Little steps have been taken, and big steps are going to be taken. We're taking some of them. We're working with other people who are also taking them, and the community is very active, and we're very happy with that. The third problem is money, um, specifically commerce. As soon as commerce becomes viable on the net, then there will be a lot more large players. And as soon as there's large players, the accelerated growth of technology and cool places to be on the net will be rapidly accelerated. That's so close to happening, I can taste it, but I said that a year ago. <laughs> um, there have been some developments with encryption, with uh, lots of mergers that make it seem more promising now than ever, but it still isn't real. There are token small places where people are doing some amount of business on the net, but as soon as it's real business, then there'll be real money, and as soon as there's real money, there'll be real content. Which is not to say the existing content is not real. I'm very happy with it. But I'll be happier with uh, even more. Uh, I'm Bonnie Nardi. I work at the Advanced Technology Group at Apple Computer. Um, and while I was watching the videos, um, I'm not sure I was looking for the three problems, but the main thing I was thinking was, <clears throat> why is it that we're doing this? Well, what is the attraction and the allure of the virtual for us? And are we melding the virtual and the real? Are they exactly the same? Are they different? Should they coexist? Um, what I want to do is just get people to reflect on why it is that we're doing this and why are we doing it at this moment in history? And I don't have the answers to that, but I was very struck by one of the uh, the uh, images in, in the video was Steven Spielberg. Two things happened there. One, he was talking to a dying girl. He was talking to somebody who is not going to be around very much longer. And I was kind of reflecting on our relationship to nature and thinking because we have destroyed so much of it, because it's literally going right now, even as we sit here and as we speak, we are perhaps creating these virtual worlds which are intended to replace our ancient relationship to nature. And again, I think we should think about why that's happening. The second thing that struck me about Spielberg was that he said to the little girl, hey, I'd like to see what you really look like. And the technology that we're looking at now has avatars, which are essentially characters. And I think where all this is really headed is for us to be able to create characters that are really versions of ourselves. One of the things that's so much fun about having a web page is that you get to present yourself to the world as you would like other people to see you. You kind of craft your own biography. and. You get to hide all the warts and, and <clears throat> kind of trumpet all the accomplishments. And I think where this technology will be very interesting is in giving people a way to present themselves as they wish other people to see them um, and to present a mediate itself to the rest of the world. So that's what I'll be looking for as I follow this technology. I'm Jim Fonero. I'm the founder of Contact. I am not a technologist, or at least Reed Wright, I think I'm not. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. Um, and uh, I wanted to make a few comments that are particularly relevant to contact. Um, 
When I started Contact in 1983, we began with a kind of family model of organization. Uh, and uh, I, I suppose I was the papa by, uh, by default. Uh, but the family model is one I was very familiar with because I learned it from my Uncle Louie, who was very good at the family model. Uh, and as we've grown over the years, we've grown like a family, uh, getting the equivalent of, of, of uh, lineal descendants and collateral relatives and in-laws uh, and the aspiring generation and then the rebellious generation. Uh, and uh, we've gotten to the place where the family model is, is having its envelope stretched, I think. And I was looking for uh, some new organizational possibilities. Uh, I didn't seem to work well within the corporate one, nor did a lot of the people who come to this kind of group. Uh, and uh, it struck me that anthropology, again, gives me an analog here. Maybe it's time to move from the family level, which is based on sort of personal and close loyalty within a group to a particular person or people, um, a kind of lineage, to a clan, which is a larger, more corporate group that has a uh, an eponymous and usually mythical ancestor. Well, I'm not real anxious to become a myth yet. Uh, but uh, it seemed to me that the consortium offered this kind of alternative uh, that where we could still retain the kind of closeness and trust among ourselves and uh, still be not only individuals but maybe even make money in this, uh, this legendary nonprofit organization of ours. Um, with respect to uh, what I wanted to do with uh, the consortium, um, I have uh, just some statements that I've, I'm going to read in, in order to get through this quickly. Uh, as I've already said, I've, I'm hoping that this will solve some organizational problems. Uh, but I uh, want to help build an interdisciplinary resource base and virtual forum that will serve as a hub of a network of information, encouragement, and assistance uh, for the benefit of education, science, art, business, and the public. You can tell I wrote this ahead of time. Um, assist in a successful global transformation from the traditional but weakening communities of residence to the new emerging communities of interest with a goal in helping humanity solve problems and living in the society of the future. Promote the interests of humankind as a whole and develop ethical approaches in multicultural interaction within a global society. And demonstrate the relevance of anthropology to studies of the future and to the future itself. I tend to think of anthropologists as being experts in human alternatives. Uh, we all, when we go through our, our training, um, learn about all the various ways that human beings do and have done things. Uh, not just the way that this society does them, but what's possible. And so that's what we're good at. And in, in a situation where we're, in a, where we're trying to create new societies, uh, particularly in, a, in the same kind of total techno ecology that we find on space stations and in extended space flight and planetary colonies, cyberspace is also uh, a place to build communities and so we can make use of some of the information that we've gained from the past and present in studying humanity here uh, and apply it really to the future. And I know the audience is probably are very provoked uh, to ask some questions uh, so uh, let's open it up. Who will start? Uh, you, what you mentioned about communities, that reminded me of uh, Usenet, which is, of course, technically not part of the Internet, but it's uh, part of it in a de facto sense. And right now, I believe the number is up to 20,000 groups on Usenet, which compose of basically 20,000 separate cultures all brought together by whatever the common item of interest is. And I have noticed that they've evolved culture in the sense that what is acceptable behavior in one group on Usenet is definitely not acceptable behavior in another group on Usenet. And I can think of several examples. Uh, I don't know if this, is an, if this is an appropriate place to tell a Usenet war story or not. Is it? <laughs> Sure. Okay. Well, anyhow, I was part of a moderated mailing list called uh, Star Trek Meets the Brady Bunch. And basically, it was for people who were both Star Trek fans and Brady Bunch fans. And there was one female member of the group. 
and about oh nine or ten guys and eventually we had a face-to-face -face meeting somewhere and after the face-to-face -face meeting this guy put a message on in this public forum to our one female member which was a rather crude and come on sexual wanna which uh, concluded with you are my wildest fantasy well the woman who was a member of the group left the group shortly after that citing that as a reason and we put 700 ma messages in the man's mailbox you know telling him that he was a bad boy and uh, he basically wound up killing the group and the thing was he couldn't understand why his behavior was unacceptable but I had found out that he had hung out in sexually oriented parts of the net where that kind of behavior is tolerated so again you know we had the development of separate cultures within Usenet, which in itself is just a small part of internet. Can I ask you a question about this? Um, this was text-based or were there... This was text-based. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess what I was saying is, what I was thinking is, were the representations uh, of the people um, gender-specific at all before um, you met? Yes, they were, because we were using, by and large, real names. You do have people who I imagine would be have transvestic tendencies that would frequently adopt a, per, a name persona which would be appropriate to the opposite sex. We didn't have any in this particular group, but I understand that is common in certain parts of the net. I was curious as to whether the individual's um, behavior toward that particular other individual changed after he found out that that person was a, a woman instead of a man or anything. Whether, whether that was involved in this. She, okay, he knew that, she, that, that okay. the woman was a woman, but then when they met, you know, it's sort of like his. We do online stuff. We do, we do it live, and there's lots of um, torrid portions. We've got two worlds, one that was seen up here, which is World's Chat, and another one, which is Alpha World. And what we found was in World's Chat, People can go on with any name they want, and the names have gotten a little, uh, a little racy in some cases. Um, in Alpha World, we have a registration system. So when I establish my persona, I also give my real email address. What is interesting is since there's a higher level of accountability, even where there's cross-dressing, or call it what you will, there's a greater level of accountability, and hence, much less obnoxious behavior. Um, we've had some very interesting uh, failures and successes in the multi-user regime that, uh, and it is interesting to see what works, but essentially you can't make people not be people, but people are often nice when they are in, incited to be nice. Uh, oh, James, you got a question? Yeah, you mind if I add a little bit? Go. Um, my background in online is extensive for me <laughs> since I'm young. Um, it's interesting because people do have a habit of kind of acting out at times. And um, when you're in an online situation, there is this separation between what you're doing and yourself that lets you do things you wouldn't normally do. And uh, you know, this has been talked about for a long time now. Um, especially in the popular media, New York Times, stuff like that. Um, one of the most interesting things is how communities react to those situations. Okay, you have these sort of censure policy where people, you know, fill the person's mailbox with a lot of mail, and that, in the end, actually seems to be one of the least effective um, because somebody else is going to come in and they're going to be from another kind of culture and they're going to do the same thing all over again. And so in fact what you find out is that it's a kind of a systems problem where um, you've got a system that's inherently not working and you need to create other systems that do work. And I'm, I know Macklin has some experience in this. Um, what, what I found is the most appropriate response is you're in, you're in a digital medium, right? You're in a medium where you have absolute control over what you see and what happens. You, you really do, um, if you're enabled, right? And so the trick is to enable people and um, to let them, if they need to, filter out certain kinds of experiences that they don't want to have. And that's kind of 
becoming pretty popular now with the Surfwatch stuff and, and everything where people are saying, hey, these sites, we don't want to have to see them, and so parents are putting software on their computer. Those are the kinds of reactions that seem to be the appropriate ones given the experience. Um, the other reaction is, oh no, don't do that. And in fact, people do do that. And so that doesn't seem to work. And it, it kind of, it's interesting now since that's a big issue with politics and stuff that it's kind of come up here. My own view is to what this guy. I think to people call these Usenet groups and so forth communities and culture. And I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, a culture is thick and rich and has a lot of traditions. Um, these are very, they're very thin entertainment oriented kinds of activities basically. And I think as we get real communities over time, as the technology gets a lot better, we'll have the kinds of real etiquette and social mores that we have in corporations and universities and other places that have longer standing traditions. And it's interesting, this gender stuff always gets brought up and I'm trying to figure out what that, that means. But I think what to look for is the development of thicker, richer, more real communities than anything that we have on the net now. I just had a, two comments uh, with respect to this. One of the things that really fascinates me about uh, this whole area is that people can create their own persona, uh, which apparently etymologically comes from the word for mask. So you're creating a mask for yourself, you're, but you have a greater ability to present an image to others than you do in real life. Uh, secondly, um, uh, if these communities do really become evolving cultures, just like any real culture, they will have to solve problems of, of social responsibility. And uh, I think that uh, uh, although we, we, can at, we can speculate about how that might be done, uh, those punishments or whatever we want will emerge naturally if we don't figure them out. Uh, people will find out how to make people stop doing things. Giving you one short example of the world's chat far too late one night. There was a, a, a person whose avatar had sort of frozen. And there were other avatars kind of playing a game with it, going back and forth through it. And that's kind of a, sort of a, that's one of the only things you can, you can do. But uh, there was a whole lot of them that came over and said, what are you doing? What are you doing to, the, to this avatar? And the person who was going back and forth through the avatar started defending themselves, oh, I can do anything I want. No, you can't. And that person started to get, you know, uh, their language started to get uh, pretty nasty. And they were driven right out of the hub of, of the station. So it was a real live sort of community pulling together. You can't just, you know, that, that person may not be able to move, their system may be frozen, they may be in the bathroom or whatever. You can't violate their avatar. So it, spontaneous kind of, uh, of, of occurrence. Um, yeah. I think we had this, the next question was Roger. Well, I think this changes the subject a bit, but I think it gets back to Wired Magazine. There's a long article in there uh, by a woman at MIT who spent a lot of time studying this stuff. And one of the things she she mentions is that <coughs> her life, and some of her research, she's seen human beings interacting where a person from the United States who speaks primarily English will be a very shy person. When that person goes to France and learns learns to speak French, their French personality is completely different from their American English personality. And she goes on and explains a whole lot of that stuff, which is very relevant to this discussion uh, here. But the question, question I had on that is, in this business of changing personality, is it how technologically possible is it now with the technology that you've got to actually amend the avatars themselves? Yeah, you can see you can obviously put different names on them. But how many sites can you go in and, and put your own face on it or put different clothes on it or change the way it looks or move it around or anything like that. This is such a cool topic. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were getting a lot of requests from people that for World Chapter and wanted to create their own avatars. And we thought, well, site, state site became extremely large and there was a lot of activity. And of course, all kinds of copyright violations that we could hope to address. But since it was done off our site, it wasn't a problem. Um, but Michael this, Jackson. Michael Jackson, Bart <laughs> Simpson, uh, uh, there's a whole x ray <laughs> section. It's what you'd expect. But some of it's really cool, some of it's a little crude. Um, but fundamentally, people are very interested in the representation of self. Um, 
arguably representation of self is as or more important than being able to build in the world, which is something that we're doing in Alpha World. Um, the technology, to answer your question directly, and the question was, for those of you who didn't hear it, is it possible to generate your own representation of self in the world? The short answer is yes, um, in World's Chat, not in Alpha World yet. Um, the other question, to, to get to uh, sort of a broader question, what's the deal? I don't get it. Why do people waste their time with this stuff? And everybody else, I assume, wants to speak with this too, but since I got the microphone first, I'll hang it for Stibbs. Um, there is a story that when the Telegraph was first, uh, first created, somebody, at, at the time, of course, newspapers happened once a week, news from the continent came by boat, things were very slow. Um, and one of the pundits at the time said, well, if we find out what's happening in, in England, it might just be that the Queen has whooping cough. The point is, why do we need instantaneous transmission? Who cares about this stuff? Anything really important and significant happens on a much longer time scale anyways. A week's delay isn't going to matter. Well, the phone has had a very strong impact on us, even though most of it's dribbled. Um, telegraph and newspapers have had strong impacts on our society, again, even though most of it's dribbled. Um, there's something really neat about being able to touch someone instantly, about being able to contact another, in this case, human being, um, and establish a dialogue, and establish a dialogue with a group of people, and create a community, and feel like you're part of a community. These are very intangibles, so at least they're intangibles for me, because I'm not an anthropologist. But I recognize that this is a very real need that people feel, and it's a very different medium. Um, when you add 3D to it, albeit clunky 3D, you know, it's not full gloves and, glove, gloves and goggles, you can't pick up an apple and hold it in front of you with your hand, it's just avatars moving on a screen, it's still more compelling. Epsilon more compelling, but that counts. I, um, think, you know, I think the fact that gloves are not required in your system and goggles are not required in your system is one of its great advantages. Remember that there's been technology for 3D movies ever since the 1950s. However, it never caught on because people didn't want to wear those silly little glasses in the theater. Just because I've been forced to make a plug. Um, Worlds is dedicated to making 3D multi-user virtual environments, essentially low-end VR, available to the masses. It's the people's VR, available to anybody with a Pentium and a high-end modem and highest end connection. <laughs> I recognize what that means. Um, let me point out what that doesn't mean on both the high-end and the low-end. On the high-end, that doesn't mean high-end SGIs. That doesn't mean high-end sunboxes. That means the PCs that people have been given by their bosses at work and in some cases have managed to scrape, enough, <coughs> scrape up enough cash to get with regular phone lines. Um, that's on one side. This is an extremely important philosophical issue to us. Uh, on the other side as well, the fact is that a vast majority of the country and the world doesn't have high-end Pentiums and very expensive modems and phone lines. Um, what do we want to do about that? Well, we're a small company. We can't do much about it. But to put it again in context, I was told that as of two years ago, over three quarters of the world had yet to make its first phone call. Phones are not ubiquitous either. And we consider that, that a ubiquitous technology. It is not up to us to make sure that our technology meets the standards of the lowest possible denominator. It's our job to establish some threshold between what looks good enough in our opinion and what enough people can get to. And this is an extremely tricky balance requiring both artistic and technological sensibilities. Well, is that a little bit different? You can say, why not do it? Um, people seem to, like Macklin said, people seem to like community. Um, if there's another way to have a community, great, let's do it. Um, the technology for a lot of the people who are doing it isn't the issue. They're already on the web, they're already online, they're doing these things. 
um, if there's a way to add community to that so that there are some of these standards developed and so that there is a way for people to socialize instead of just surf, then why not? Um, we've had communities for two million years, so that isn't really the issue. I, I think what's happening is that because of our educational system where we all go to college and learn all kinds of weird things and become anthropologists and so forth, you find that the people who are in your family and your local community often don't share interests with you. And so what you want to do is reach out to people who do share your interests and become engaged in authentic activities with those people. And those people can be all over the world. I know I have lots of contact with Russian psychologists, and there's no way I could do that w without the network. And I think that's actually why we're moving now. That's one of the reasons why we're moving toward these virtual worlds and getting away from our local physical communities and spending a lot of time on the network. Yeah. Being an anthropologist, I suppose I, of course, I'm going to agree with Monty. Uh, sure. I think that, uh, that in addition to the fact that we are moving more into uh, communities of interest, uh, it's not simply because of our education, too. It's also because due to the large-scale nature of our society, um, and, and this appears to be something that is going to continue to occur, uh, many people uh, are being shortchanged by their their traditional communities of residence, uh, their families, their their neighborhoods, and so on, and find this to be uh, uh, another way. Not exactly. It, it's not. It's not a substitute for real human communities with uh, primate grunts and wheezes, which we still need. But uh, it's better than not having anything at all. And uh, some people find them, uh, of course, uh, superior. Um, there's the added possibility of, uh, so many people have talked about, you know, life doesn't come with a user's manual. Well, but life in a, in a virtual community sort of has a user's manual, at least more than, than, than physical life does. And this allows us to create that better world that we wanted to, to, to make an engineered community like a utopia uh, actually work, at least for a while, and, and we can mess with it too. And, and nobody, well, at least as far as I know, nobody really gets killed. Uh, human societies, probably all societies, require some kind of system of social control um, to to maximize uh, social responsibility of the members. I think what will happen, and is already happening, is that these these uh, virtual communities will find their own uh, systems of social control. Uh, the the particular uh, rewards and and, and uh, punishments will be may be different than the physical one, but they'll be, they will evolve, or the society won't be able to maintain it. So. Hmm. Um, yeah, I agree with, uh, with these comments. And I, I think the difference is not whether it's regional or whether it's interest-based. I think whether there, it's whether there's something at stake or not. And if you're on the Brady Bunch, well, if you can't uh, you know, associate with people who care about the Brady Bunch, you haven't lost a lot. But when you do get, most people haven't, hopefully. When you do get involved in activities that you really care about, whether it's regional or interest-based over the network, then you will find accountability because people really care about the outcomes, and I think that's what we should look for. I'll, I'll be quick. There's two things that come to mind. The first is um, someone was talking to us and said, you can tell a lot about people by the kind of worlds they create. Um, there are some are highly rule-based, some are much more free-form and dynamic and organic. Certainly, some will be extremely rigid and may even have laws imposed on them, i.e., punish and copy, sort of dot, dot, dot. Um, others will be more organic. And that brings the second point, which is you've got to be careful, or at least clear, and I'm not clear, with what you actually mean by sustainability. Um, if some people bail, that does not necessarily mean that it is not sustainable. Similarly, if the group dies, it is not necessarily clear that the group died because somebody was obnoxious. So you've got to be clear about what your goals are and what, about what your terms mean. Now, that sounds like grade school stuff. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to be uh, 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 simplistic, but I'm not really sure how, how to tease these issues apart. And I think they have to be teased. 
think we have to understand that we're dealing with a radically different environment here and that we're going to come up with radically different solutions from what we've come up with. Um, we, as physical creatures, have an inherent identity um, on cyberspace that's compromised. And it may be that, in fact, systems that try to impose that, that sort of identity on that, it is, an, it is an imposition. Maybe we need systems that don't deal with this, this idea of identity because like I said, it's radically different. Maybe we need radically different systems. Um, one question from uh, Al and Al here, which you may all want to consider, is um, just to finish up the panel, is as these communities become ubiquitous, how does this affect traditional nation-state boundaries? Uh, many of you may have seen John Perry Barlow's uh, Declaration of Independence on the net when the telecommunications bill was signed, basically saying, we are our own community, stay out. We are creating something new. We are independent from you. Well, how, how realistic is this? But it was a very compelling uh, declaration, and I think it's going to go down in the future political history book somewhere. Uh, but I think it's something we should think about. Um, just to let you, you know, obviously there's so many more questions to ask. The consortium, if you visit the website, there's a lot of material there. We're planning to hold a full-scale, uh, if we can get the volunteers in the site, a full-scale brainstorming session somewhere in the Bay Area in the May-June time frame where we'll have a longer time to have breakout sessions to, to deal with these issues because we, we have the chance right now, some of the people in this room, we have the chance to influence how this turns out. Maybe in small ways, maybe commercial forces will, will dictate most of it, but we do have a chance because it's at the birth phase and it's a rare opportunity. And if, it's, if it turns out, I mean, maybe it won't, but if it turns out to be as important to the 21st century as the telephone and TV and radio were to the 20th, it's a pretty, uh, it's pretty momentous, these are momentous years. Um, so anyway, uh, if you're interested in the organization, we have a membership form, I'm giving my plug. Uh, ask the right questions um, that we need to uh, about whether we should do this or do this in, in different ways. Taking the time to be here, I know it's, it's not what we're going to do now is take a, a bathroom break and we're going to see a virtual world uh, that has been constructed recently in BRML uh, for a Japanese telephone company, I believe. And uh, just uh, hear from some experts in how they build these worlds. I want to ask for um, models. We have polygon budgets for them as well. Uh, 400 <laughs> polygons for You're just each character. Um, oh, and then we built in a lot of um, uh, this other sort of history here. Kind of bells and whistles that are that are part of the VRML 1.0. Sharing space with a 2D representation of this thing, um, HTML, some navigation information, and a 3D space. Okay. Um, PCs right now are very limited in just the how fast they can push video to the screen. Okay, that's called bleeding. Um, An alien performer. To be on the safe side, I have a posture which reduced the size of my body outline, another common way of showing non-aggressive intentions among Earth animals, and waiting. When the mossback regained consciousness and saw me, I utilized its known greeting behavior, slowly turning my back and displaying a party-colored sweater I had just borrowed from a fellow crew member. <coughs> Such an act might seem rude in some human cultures, though primates commonly use it in submission or to elicit friendly grooming. But here, I'm using familiar and non-aggressive intentions learned from the moss packs themselves. Seventh floor, please. Seventh floor, please. Bridge. Where, Where is it? Three it? main artists. Where's the holodeck? Yeah. Yeah. How important is it? Yeah. That was one of the first. Boy, set up. So it looks like a typical there, we holiday room except here. for this. Here's Someday this will be ubiquitous. Finders. We figured this in the hotel uh -huh. room. On the phone, huh? mm. So what are we looking at here? What's so this, this is this, this is the Epona the planet. Huh. Epona the planet. The, the planet right here. So this type was M, type, type M, M, yeah. Type M planet, uh, according uh, to Star Trek. <laughs> um, slightly <laughs> smaller than Earth. There's a there's a pretty detailed so point nine years of rundown. The, all of these these were done by Wolf Reed. Did these hmm. so planet Fred pictures? Wolf? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find out. There's a write-up. Oh, here's here's the original thing from Contact, the Cody mm -hmm. primer that 
that we were given when we started out saying how do you do world building. This is the star system. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Where the, the, the two planet is. It's the third planet, huh? And it's the third planet <laughs> and this is the somebody went through the whole thing to design the solar mm. system and say this is the world and this is before it even got the name of home. Oh, wow. I'm not sure where that how the planet ended up getting familiar. named after the Celtic god of horses, the goddess of horses. <gasps> is that what it is? Yeah, oh. that's Apona. It's oh, the, of course the Celtic goddess of horses. Uh. And I'm not sure why it got named that, but I somewhere like along the line, about well, it's always year magicians two. Well, and wizards in this world. I'm born near the horse, you know. You are, well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Very dear to home. Dear to my heart. Here's, here's geology and history. Mm -hmm. um, carbon cycle stuff and how the planet works and the, y this was Martin Fogg he says we want no humans we want no <laughs> humans in rubber suits oh, we want yeah. no elvi and we want no squids right. no squids <laughs> <laughs> is he allergic? no couple. way well, <laughs> you can exclude said, before you invent yeah, this, <laughs> this is definitely this creationism is, yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately yes I mean, <laughs> this was not an accident this was designed, <laughs> designed by biological wonders. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was, uh, how, there was no accident involved, but there was a lot of arguments. Uh -huh. yeah. There was plenty of arguments. Of and Olympian there was, proportion, there was, no uh, There was a lot of, this is, this whole one right here, this is all different artwork of, of yeah. different animal forms yeah. and stuff like that. A lot of these back here were done by Wolf Reed. Oh. This one happens to be one of mine. Wow. The spring rock. Um, this is a lot of stuff on biology mm -hmm. and how wow. these creatures worked. Um, vocalization. Are they carbon based hearing. for the most part? They're carbon based life forms. They. Um, there's basically three. There's three groups of of animals. There are three groups of, of life. Like on, on the Earth, there's two kingdoms: the plant kingdom, and the animal kingdom. On Apollo, there's three. There's the archae plants, archae animals, and the myophytes. Myophytes. And myophytes have both the, the plant-like form, which is basically a stationary form, mm -hmm. and then an animal form, which is mobile. But they both have the same kind of of, it's not a skeletal structure. It's a, it's a um, kind of a muscle, a skeleton muscle, kind of a structure together. Like a so clam. It's, uh, no, it's because a clam has a clam has the shell, which is the skeleton, and then it has the muscle inside. This is where the muscle itself is actually the structure uh, and the moving part uh, hmm, of the like creature. A snake. Well, this well, a snake, snake has still skeleton, has too. a skeleton. Yeah. Exoskeleton. So. There's there's no skeleton involved. The muscle tissue itself is is, is fibrous, fibrous enough, and it, and it works by um, this, this, some of the same workings that keep plants up is, that don't have the cell walls, the thick cell walls, the what do they call it, Hy hydro something or other, hydrostatic pressure, which keeps the plant basically stable. This uses the same form. What about microbial? Talked briefly about some diseases involved and stuff like that. Um, we didn't get real involved in it. Um, we did a lot of we did a lot of stuff on the insect. So you have more than one sentient species in this. No, there's basically only one. What is that? You, um, it's an avian. Hmm. Green is at the top. There's a respiratory. It pumps it through the body, so the air itself goes through the body. It doesn't really have the same kind of a bloodstream, right? Mm. So it has Not no, a it, yeah, no the, middleman. So there's no iron. There is a there is a fluid system, but there's no iron base in it that, that holds the oxygen. The oxygen is pumped through. Got it. Okay. Hmm. Now what what has been the pentapods? And there's a lot of different groups of pentapods. Wow. There's the ceratridens, and then there's the the twin tails, and then there's all the avians come from the pentapod group. And that's the shot of the uh, sentient uh, avian. And there's some better pictures. And Greg Barr is where? Is he local? He happened to be twin tails. Have you animated them yet? Yes, I have some twin tails running in an animation. I can show you that. Boy, they must be These big. are uh, silicopods. Mm. They, they're the opponent form of insect. Mm. Um, there's Wolf did lots of work on these guys. He really loved these guys, mm. so he went all out. Mm. And 
in designing these because he had a great time with them. Oh my god, they are beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he has a whole section on there. Um, these are the, the basic, now these are myo, these are myoskeletal plants. Mm -hmm. So they're still mm. plants, they have no central nervous system, however they do move. Mm -hmm. They will actually move themselves with um, to aim towards the sun, they'll close themselves up in storms, so on and so forth. So they are m moving, but they're not particularly intelligent. Here's a parasitic form. Mm. Uh, here's a truss weed, helicopter vine. These are some 3D images. Mm -hmm. This is one of Stephen Hanley's 3D images. What are they um, using? They, the they were using, for the 3D stuff, they were using uh, Strata mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on Max. I was the only weird one in the group that used PC. <laughs> so I was using Photoshop, and I have Animation Master mm -hmm. cool. on it now, which mm -hmm. um, supposedly it's a good program, but I have to arguing with the operating system on that thing. Did, uh, Outrageously. Develop a, uh, a uh, social life for these creatures? Um, we started into, we did some, and I think the news are back here, these are called the elves. So on each creature mm. that somebody invented, they had to do mm -hmm. a certain write-up. Mm -hmm. uh, physical description, habitat, life cycle, mm -hmm. um, behavior, physiology, Evolutionary history, so on and so and forth. Where are you at right now? Do you feel that this is no. basically is this frozen at this point, or are people still contributing? Right, right now, it's pretty much frozen as part as of, of what's been created. Mm -hmm. Right now, the only thing that's been going on is is presentations. We've been doing presentations. We're trying to get a video worked up with all the different stills and animations, and. We're also trying to get some kind of a museum walkthrough, take mm -hmm. a lot of these pictures, blow them up like the one Stephen Hanley's downstairs that Nancy was showing you. Right. Mm -hmm. By scanning it or using the camera. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been, I've been in it from the beginning. Yeah, you see me have quite well, we, we borrowed that, actually, to put together the walkthrough, mm -hmm. also done by Wolf Reed, of the, of the different plant type. The planet is smaller than Earth, and, and it's like 0.7 the gravity, so it's a lighter atmosphere, less gravity, so things do move differently. Mm -hmm. And these particular features are basically, they're, they're the pentapod body style. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're all muscles. And, and they're all the muscle structure. But they're basically using one, mm -hmm. uh -huh. one for locomotion, the other two are stabilizers. Mm -hmm. That's why they're twin tails. And then the, then the five and six are the ones that face forward, like mm -hmm. these small hands. Mm -hmm. That niche. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's, yeah. There are several other, of the archae animals, one of the major um, run the videos and talking about Star Trek and Babylon 5 and we were <laughs> actually modeling pieces and, and talking about culture. <laughs> we got up to the point, this happens to be one of the spring croc varieties, one of the clamshell idea with a single leg. Mm -hmm. One of the few remaining animal types that has a real skeleton. Quite stupid, quite large. What's, this, it's what's the locomotion? Is it spring? It's it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a single leg. Stomach. Yeah, it's it's a it's a big <laughs> mouth with a stomach and, and a single leg, and it, it basically lies in wait for oh. for its its prey and then it's pounces it's on. Mm -hmm. Are those skills? Um, it has um, all of these creatures because they have a short evolutionary span. There's basically what happened on the planet. There's these tremendously long hundred million year ice ages hmm. where basically all land animals die. Mm -hmm. So there's basically almost nothing left on land except huh. in in the equator tide pools. So every hundred million years then there you get another cycle of volcanic eruption and, and carbon cycle and, and that they have tremendous amounts of stamina. 
So this guy, in, in a chase, could never keep up with it. So it just has to lie in wait and surprise, and it's the only way it can survive. And that's why it's one of the few surviving members, because most of the ones that did rely on stamina couldn't compete anymore with the myophytes and died off. Oh, it would be interesting to run one of these worlds through like a simulator, like SimCity, to see how it would survive. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of like Sim Life. Right, yeah. and there's, there was an awful lot of discussion on that, whether these guys would have to survive yeah, or die. Or whether yeah. the, one of the earliest discussions, this is still going on to this day, is whether or not the whole point, uh, planet of Epona would turn into a giant ice cue ball and never s resurrect itself in another um, mm -hmm. volcanic age. And, huh. you know, then we'd have a very short tenuous. Make a good entry again, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> so, we to talk to people that we could. If we can come up with one of the concepts, so if we've nice already if done, talk to to Wolf or Greg, the partners. Right. And yeah, yeah. And I think so. And get some folks in there. Yes, because I can definitely involved in that. Then later on, when we started going into the game end of it and stuff like that, but you know when it was supposed to be the most exciting, and it probably was for some people. Then that's when I got the most bored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite life part? Um, I was great, rather partial to Spring Crocs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're big, stupid, and they, they look pretty scary. And, and, uh, I, also, I also really enjoyed when we started getting into the culture of the avians. Mm -hmm. When you think about what would, what would be the basic culture behind an intelligent avian. Mm -hmm. And we spent a lot of time thinking about that and pondering it and wondering about it. And none of us were real highly educated anthropologists. We've all been to the, the contact meetings. We've, we've hung around Jim Fanaro for a while. Um, some of us have, have gone to his classes and, and, and things like that, but um, we ran across some stuff that we really need some assistance on and at the time. We just we weren't getting a lot of anthropologists involved. I mean, we spent so, we had so many geologists and chemists and, we, and uh, biologists and botanist and climatologist involved and they all had a great time but mm -hmm. when we got to the end all of the anthropologists waiting for all the hard science people to get done uh, with it kind of got bored and, and went away so mm -hmm. by the time we were ready to do that we didn't have anybody there and then they came back so um, there was some at the last contact there was some in we did spark some interest in anthropologists, we thought we we had it made, and we finally had some hooked in again. We were going to get some really good help there, but then again, th they didn't stay. We got we got this cohesive group of all these other people who kept coming, and we couldn't get any anthropologists in there to come on a regular basis. So um, we did some culture stuff. We, we we even had a creation myth at one point written. We presented that last year here. It was oh, yeah? Yeah. Last year. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, wow. It should, I don't know if that's on, yeah, it should be on tape, shouldn't it, somewhere? It's written down somewhere. Yeah, because you wrote, you wrote it. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it ever made it into one of the binders or anything like that on culture. Yeah. But that was basically just started. It was pretty basic. We did some stuff on what, what a, what was it, an opportunistic flying scavenger would have for a religion. Mm. Do you find that your, your own interests are more drawn towards uh, worlds where you can be creative and apply the skills to things that you can imagine, or do you find that you're coming out of having like a great appreciation of what's here on this planet and trying to turn that into some kind of new insight? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the the, the the art part of it is the part that I got most involved in. I'm going to go with Steve. The full imagination, it would not have been as interesting. As if it, it, was the, it was a part of it that these these seem to function as, as real creatures, you know. They're, they're, even though they look strange and they look alien, there's, there's, there's something inside them that, that would actually, according to all of these guys, would actually function as a life form made it more interesting and more of a challenge to try and put a body style and, and, and a life around yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to... The elaborate. Yeah. So, be 
because you know you can go and, and you can sit down and you can draw really great stuff and when you got things like Animation Master and Photoshop and, and all that kind of stuff, you don't have to worry about physical laws and chemistry and all that kind of stuff, but it's just when you get the added challenge of, of putting all that in there, here's a creature somebody came up with, you know, like a pentapod or a ceratriton or a spring croc, and, and you want to put some life around this creature. What's it really look like? What's it move like? And all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff like that. And then justify it. Right? And then, well, it, it was, it, it happened the other way, and, and that's the way Cody works, is you, mm -hmm. instead of trying to say, well, this is the creature I want, you guys go figure out how that's going to lot, how it live. It, you, what you hear is you given here's the planet, what the planet's like, what's going to evolve well, there. Start, start at the beginning mm -hmm. and go step by step. Mm -hmm. And then when they go through all that and they come up with the chemistry and the body plan, the myoskeletal structure and the and the, the pentapod design, then they give that to the artist and then they say, take this and, and figure out what this thing's going to look like. It's interesting. So they the supposed limitations of physical reality actually create greater novelty in the uh, species. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, you're trying to create the way that, that trying to simulate like what happened on Earth, yes. or what we think happened on Earth. Right, in a new sorry. playground. <laughs> yeah, so new set of rules. We want to we'll we create our own playground, basically, <laughs> and, and everybody had a good time doing it. The, the geologists had a good time in the playground and stuff like that. And then you get people and there's a number of people who want to write stories about a poem. Okay. We went through this thing, we went through this whole exercise, we went through the evolutionary process, and then we came up with this planet. And now what happened, and, and we, put, we put skin on all these aliens, and now they look like something, and they move like something, but now what do they do? What's their history? I mean, how do they live? Kind of story they how do they interact with each other? And how would they interact with, and then the, the basic Jim Fanaro question is, how would they interact with a human who came down mm -hmm. to visit them, you know, besides lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if they're virtual worlds, people will be able to pop into this world and hang out for a while, and yeah. it would be interesting to have some kind of protocols by which they deal with humans yeah. or other creatures from other artificial worlds that are being generated. And there was, there was a lot of work done on, on the intelligent avian, how would it talk? How would it communicate? Do they talk? They, they do they talk. Speech? They have they have a form of speech and there's there's a write-up on there about it. It's it's more like tones. There's the way that birds do 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 do. Then the the problem with them is is they have they have some pretty strict ear limitations in the frequencies they can hear. Mm. They their their eardrum is centered, there's a certain resonant frequency at the eardrum. They can tune the resonant frequency, but what it means is is that you get like a, a 6 dB per octave fall off. Certain frequency. There's other frequencies you can't hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good way to shut up. So, <laughs> <laughs> and th that's true, but then when you want to talk to somebody, you, you have to retune them. So you, there's, there's a certain definite protocol in how you come and, and start talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, hi, how are you? You know, it's something at first you have to get them to the point where they can actually hear what you're saying. Because I mean, you have to have almost maybe a visual language that indicates some basic yeah. things. Yeah, you have yeah. some real sentience behind it to make it interesting. I believe it was, here. I'm here, I want to talk to you, and this is the frequency. Yeah. So I, I gather you're one of the collaborators in this world? Uh, one of them, yeah. Yeah. And then this, the story treatment is, is also there that I want ah. to show you this weekend as well. Yeah. And started out with something, but had some more textures. Yeah. The Coast groups that have gotten to be very close friends. We we still meet at least once every once a month and work on stuff. Uh, we attempt you know. to work. Yeah, we, we, we work play right a lot too. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be careful. Be careful. That's good. So it's the, around this project. People from England and Scotland and uh, the Netherlands and other uh, rest of the U.S. that have worked on this. We've met. We've met actually met together in person here, but we've spent a lot of time on email, sending stuff back and forth. And we got to go to uh, Scotland last year to intersection, and we presented this world there, and a lot of us were there. Huh.
Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were at a Cody and we're at contact, and I really I've always liked doing the Cody's here, uh -huh. and um, I got started because I was Jim Panaro's student at Cabrillo and a lifelong sci-fi fan, right. and so I started doing this, and they started um, Cody that year. We had no human team; we just had an alien team, and we started working on it. And the next year we came back and we still only had a, an alien, alien team and we worked more and then we decided we really wanted to work so we started meeting uh, in our homes privately, uh, alternating between our home and Stephen's house and uh, Wolf and Julie's house and uh, we meet like once every two weeks or so and just to get going before we made our final big presentation last year at Contact mm -hmm. and we had you know, people all over the world working on this, and it was just so neat. <laughs> yeah, wow. How far can we go with it? What what can we do with it? What's, you know, we're started now. We don't want to quit. <laughs> yeah. 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 It would be, it'd be, oh, is that the one that you guys fixed up? Huh? Yeah, a lot of it. Here he is. Know. This is toward the end of uh, Friday. <laughs> Bruce is, how's, how are you feeling right now, Bruce? Oh, the relieved. <laughs> the, relieved. the hard part's over, huh? <laughs> the hard part. The first. The first big community oh. meeting, or little community meeting. Okay, I live in a purple house. So now you can uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, show. Yeah. 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 That's great. Who's Stay tuned so for more <laughs> from Contact. Hey, maybe, uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. There is, Reed Ryan. Any solar system simulation? So they're recording everything that's going on in, uh, in computer. We learned this week why we can't have the Unix machines open, but we can have the Vax open. So I reactivated my Vax account, and now I have to tell Net to the Vax and then tell Net over to my own account because I learned in a Unix environment. Uh, what's your profession? I'm, an anthrop I'm a cultural anthropologist. I have no business doing all of this computer stuff. And, and I am beginning to look like a real dinosaur. <laughs> and uh, look, so it's, it's been a great experience oh. in the class, mm -hmm. since there's no structured agenda for it, but mm -hmm. pr solve the problem. I'll look around and I'll find seniors tutoring sophomores and freshmen tutoring juniors. And it's, there's all this peer teaching going on, and it completely ignores oh, yeah, yeah. the stratification the of yeah. freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And how does that make and you feel? I love it. I love it. I am so tired of doing classroom lectures with the furniture nailed to the floor. And I still do them. But it makes going into this other class so refreshing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like an idea of evolution in education. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's never going to replace high information content classes. I mean, if you're taking Chemistry 101 and you've got to do the table of period, the periodic table, you're better doing that by lecture and step-by-step -step instruction. But in this where you say, all right, you're the population that's been selected to establish the first permanent settlement on Mars. Design a community that's viable and plausible and worth living in. So, uh, mm. I went out and then you just step back and, uh, and let them really go at it. What has to be done? Yeah, How do you divide up the labor? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Yeah, How do we out. talk to each other once we begin to get the pieces of the puzzle? Mm. And they bring all the stuff they've learned and begin to put it back together. And many of them <gasps> come back and said, it's the only class we've ever had that had that synthetic quality to it, and where we had to talk to each other, where we even got to know everybody else's names. <laughs> so it's a real little and social it, Well, it becomes, and because I'm yeah. teaching it for anthropology, yeah. Yeah. once they get this thing all going, then I pull them back out, and I say, all right, now, start looking at the culture you have built. And they're not aware that they have built it. What, humans, us, the culture? Yeah, humans are never aware of having <laughs> built their culture. And then they begin to see, oh, yeah. And all of the, the slang terms that came in that only the Martians know and are very disturbing to people around them who don't know what they're talking about. The alums pick up real quick. Um, and it, it's a because of the, the group energy, it creates a cadre of alumni who help me out year after year after year. And I've got six years of an alumni association. Oh, really? I'm trying to figure out how to get them pay dues. <laughs> then I wouldn't have to worry about getting grants for this. I just collect the alumni dues. And, and pay yeah. for what we need. Yeah, send him a newsletter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Where'd you get that? 
Push no, no, you have to you push, you, uh, push the end here. <laughs> That's funny! <laughs> that that sounds so like funny. It. Kathy, you have to hold this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I won't yeah. let it Wait. go. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm getting it back. I didn't, I didn't mean to lose the context for that. It's after the great accident. <laughs> This guy. Instead of basing this thing on work and getting sick, the theme has always been come play with it. Well, immediately you lay down the assumption of trust. And then this tremendous unself conscious interaction. Yes? Yes. Try to be unself conscious when you know somebody's got something aimed in your face. Right. Several of us have a background with primate behavior, and one of the biggest things with primate behavior is play. Yeah. And then you look at humans and you find we start to play earlier, we have more forms of play, and we play longer in our life right up until death than any other primate. And there's this whole trend through the whole primate order of increasing the amount of play. So it becomes the most human thing to do. After we get the machines to do everything else, what's left for us is to do the play. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I did on a real crusade to encourage people to stop taking everything so seriously and try and live a little. Yeah. That's a while. You just want to engage? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I can snap with a block. Show them. 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 Show because oh. you can no. both do that. Good science for future children. Future generations. Yeah, this is um, this is a uh, experiment we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, a rock makes drunk people laugh. No, this isn't a good test. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Move to websites. I see a and I know. Oh, well, um, um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, the reason that the dot is raised is so you can push it in like a soda Touch thing technology. and you can get at home light. Actually, our oh, company cool. yeah. sensory touch technology if it's you put them in you guys haven't actually even get joined have with you it. No, but, yeah, with with it. It. but I remember the Society for Cable Telecommunications Engineers and I think that counts KK yeah. if you have 20 bucks you can join <laughs> 35 <laughs> 35 for what 35 for guys <laughs> no it's more for guys yeah, that's what but that. apparently the mailing yeah, list I'm not on it yet is really entertaining uh -huh. because apparently it's a bunch of you know guys that sit around and talk but well, you know, there are women out there. Are you taping this? Yeah. I hate you. There's a There's a better point. Get on tape. Women and technology. We Here they are. In person. Get with it. Get with it. Get with it. Get with it. Here they are. And then close the door. Close your name home. Close the door. Get with it. Shield the name Get with it. Sure. Yeah, let's get the macro. Macro. What's the macro? Oh, macro. The macro version. <laughs> there is your lump of gold. Okay. We're levitating the ball. Can we the ball? We're it's levitating it. the ball. Oh, okay. we're going to see oh, this. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the tickles are. This is really. Oh, really? Yeah, there's one magic spot. Come on, is it marked? No. No, it's cool. a secret spot. Must find it by right. feeling. Is it a girl? Have we gone easy? overboard? That's the question we have to continually <laughs> ask ourselves you, throughout the night. I'm telling you all the things that I think are significant. Have we lost the plot? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very obvious. Yeah, she'll find it. Let her concentrate. Let her concentrate. She'll find um, it. Pretend you're row. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. At three comms, Cindy Kim. J U N G. Like in Jung. Like in Carl, yeah. Yes, only Chinese, right? She's a good friend of mine. She's more than an idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
I've been, been there since um, Three Combat Bridge. Oh, okay. So, it's so she's been there for a long time. Yeah. So, so that's uh, from um, Kathy. Kathy uh, Whitbrod? Whitbrod. Whit Kathy Whitbrod, Three Com. Yeah. Um, all right. What's this all about, son? What do you think? Well, Al. Yeah. <laughs> Liberty. So there's a little bunny out here. It's it's the bun. Bunny. And the sun. The bun and the sun, huh? No, no, the sun's over there. The sun's over here. And the bun's down there. Yeah, the bun. Look at this. When you look hmm. straight down in this, it's hmm. like it's like a bunch of golden spirals. All right, Bob, we'll see you later. I mean, it's like a total fractal universe down there. Visually. This one has a lot of very, very brightly colored flowers. It blooms several times a year. Mm. Yeah, you, so, so you're, you, uh, you are happy with the quality of his visual material, video yes. material that he provides. Always. And, and the sound bites. Beautiful. Is that, is that, are you pleased with the sound bites? Wonderful. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And, and how about the warm wear? Amazing. What about the warm wear? Is there, is there, how's that going? The light. Okay, so light. you're delighted in the warm wear. Mm. You're, you're proud of the visual and you're enjoying <laughs> the sound bites. Mm. So, um, the perpetual hot tub. The perpetual hot tub. We've beyond, never had that before. Beyond Ooh, bright. Every time we like, always. In bed. Yeah, we've never had that beyond before. Beyond bright. That's first. In bed. Wow. For this. I think it's a it's a good upgrade. Story for one: Ridge. the yeah. perpetual hot tub. Yeah. <laughs> Humans, they think we're like the fly, the great flying predators. Pictures of our uh, of our pre of our variety of predators that exist. Before. Those of you who aren't focused on this uh, intense interaction are going to notice a giant eight foot tall metallic spider walking down the road into the middle of the village here. <laughs> Okay, pause for a minute so we can get some reactions. Uh, it looks kind of like a, a crab or something, but it's eight feet tall and shiny. What on earth are you doing about this? Putting our, our younger cast with the swords in front of us. The, 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 uh, yeah. uh, okay, uh, start the action again. Uh, the looks like the giant eight foot tall spider is frozen in place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, stronger than you are. <laughs> okay, and what are you saying? Help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what are the, what are the rest of you doing now? Okay, okay, so he's called for help. Uh, there's a conversation among the elders going along in the backfield here. Mr. Translator. What I'm suggesting is that in this unfamiliar environment that our two elders of the two clans try to say hello. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, let's let's freeze the frame here for a second. Alright, alright. Let's pause for a minute here. Uh, why don't you describe uh, what you look like to the 